your lungs together. Good evening, everyone. All right, that's what I like to hear. Thank you all for coming. Good evening, everyone. My name is Steve Beck with the Office of Research and Economic Development, and we are so glad that you're here for as, we, uh, uh, as you join us tonight at the Varsity Theater for another edition of LSU Science Cafe, and we're, we're also streaming everywhere online. Over the past 10 years, more than 100 LSU scholars and researchers have shared their life's work and expertise with you through LSU Science Cafe. I'd like to thank all of our past speakers who have so generously given their time and energy to this program. And to you, our audience, I'd like to thank you uh, for all of, the, all of your participation and engagement over the past 10 years. Here's to another 10 years. We want to remind you that LSU Science Cafe's goal is to continue to build a strong, informed community by providing access to reliable information, new ideas, and cutting-edge research, scholarship, and creativity from faculty, experts, and researchers in fields across the university. Tonight's event is brought to you in partnership with local public radio station WRKF 89.3 FM and our sponsor, Campus Federal Credit Union. Uh, often we have Timmy Clay from WRKF come and say a few words. He is now the proud papa of three baby girls. That happened this morning. So, Timmy, I hope you're, I hope you're not watching. Be with the girls, congratulations. But we do, have, uh, we do have Brian Ainsworth, who is the Vice President of Business Development and Community Relations for Campus Federal Credit Union, and he'll say a few words on behalf of Campus Federal. Brian? Thank you, Dr. Beck. Uh, it's wonderful to be here this evening and for Campus Federal to partner with LSU Science Cafe and LSU Office of Research and Economic Development. We're excited about the topic tonight. Uh, thank you all for taking time to be here to listen and to learn and to share with others. I uh, also want to thank Holly Carruth for uh, behind the scenes making this possible. And from the members and the employees, thank you so much. And we look forward to the partnership all year long. Have a wonderful evening. And I can't believe I got trumped by a man with, with three girls tonight, but God bless him. Thanks, Brian. And just as a reminder, do stick around till the end because we'll be announcing not one, not two, this time three winners of, pro of, of gifts from Campus Federal and from, w and from WRKF uh, 89.3 FM. Now I'd like to introduce tonight's speakers, two outstanding scientists from Pennington Biomedical Research Center who will talk about their new nationwide study on how a person's health, based on their demographics, uh, microbiome, metabolism, family history, physical fitness, and strength, can impart the way in which they respond to food and diets. Dr. Leanne Redman and Dr. Eric Ravison will join 14 other universities and leverage the All of Us program, which is collecting biomedical data on a million people across the US and the power of artificial intelligence for their groundbreaking NIH-funded Nutrition for Precision Health study. This is really amazing stuff, and we're so excited to have them here. Dr. Leanne Redman is professor of clinical science who studies human physiology. She designs and conducts controlled clinical trials where diet and or physical activity are changed with the goal to understand the mechanisms of obesity development as well as to develop and test interventions to promote health in women and for healthy aging. She has published more than 200 research articles, reviews, and book chapters around metabolism, obesity, calorie restriction, exercise, and pregnancy. Dr. Eric Ravison is a world expert in translational research in obesity and type 2 diabetes. Over his more than 35-year career, he has conducted numerous clinical investigations on measures of energy expenditure, body composition, carbohydrate metabolism, 
and biomarkers of aging and health and disease states. Over the past 20 years, he has established a wet lab studying skeletal muscle and adipose tissue crosstalks and the relationship of these two tissues on inflammation, nutrition, partition, nutrition, nutrient, I'm sorry, nutrient partitioning. That's hard. Say that 10 times really fast. Nut nutrient partitioning and insulin sensitivity. He has published more than 450 peer-reviewed manuscripts in the field of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and aging, and he has mentored more than 60 postdoctoral fellows. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Leanne Redman and Dr. Eric Ravison. Thank you very much, Dr. Beck, for these very nice words. I, I, I guess I have to revise my bio <laughs> because it's more than 35 years that I have been in this field. But anyway, it's a real pleasure tonight to be with Leon Redman, who is doing all the science, and I talk about it, and uh, to talk about artificial intelligence. First of all, it reorganized my driving. I used to get lost everywhere. Now I put varsity, theater, I arrive here by the shortest way. And I think that this is what we're talking about when we talk about nutrition in the future. It's a little bit sad because it's amazing to be in a place like this and basically have a bar and people eating their food here and give a talk, a scientific talk. But tonight uh, we would like just to mention uh, some of the things that we are engaging on at Pennington, which is this nutrition for precision health. And basically, I think that, oh, he went back. Oh. Uh, Hippocrates uh, said that a long time ago, 500 years uh, before Christ, let food be thy medicine and medicine by the thy food. And I think it's still true that we are suffering from our diet when it comes to disease, but also we realize now that diet can be a source of well-being, not only well-being, but metabolic health and all that. And I think that this is why it's so important now that we pay attention and the NIH has decided to go to the next step have one size does not fit all. Every year you have the best diet of the year. Uh, they talk, you know, Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, and all that. But we know that one diet can be very good for someone, but not so good for someone else. And this is where we are with this precision medicine and engaging in knowing more about not only your genetics, but your environment, your education, your, uh, you know, all these factors which can influence your health. And here, uh, the, the, the state of the uh, nation is not so good when it comes to chronic disease of aging. 74% of U.S. adults have overweight or obesity, 74%. This is amazing. It was not the case before 1980. It's been rising tremendously over the past 50 or 60 years. Uh, overweight and obesity affect about 40% of our children. Now, I remember when I was a kid, it was very, very rare to see a child with obesity. Cardiovascular disease, we know that uh, is the leading cause of death. High blood pressure, high cholesterol. Diabetes, diabetes is so prevalent. I worked for 15 years with the Pima Indians in, in Arizona they have the highest prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the world. And there was no diabetes when Jocelyn visited Arizona uh, in the 1930 when he was trying to recover uh, from a disease and he was sent in the desert uh, to help him with the condition. Uh, cancer, we know now 13 kinds of cancer are attributed to obesity. And we know that nutrition also is very important for bone health and muscle strength. Now, Leon Renman, who prepared this slide, put a quote of myself, and it's food lies at the epicenter of health and disease, but clinical nutrition is still limited to a one-size-fits-all approach. 
And this is what we are going to go away from uh, in the future. Now, when I, you know, over the past uh, 20 years or so, uh, we had the food pyramid. The USDA said the US population is to have a better diet. You know, before the diet was really, what do we miss in the diet? What is missing? You know, are you deficient in vitamin C? Are you deficient in vitamin D? And so on. This was the old stories. Now the question is, what is good for your health and what is bad for your health? And I think that they derived this pyramid of food, and I'm not going to go through it, but you know, the base basically is bread, cereal, rice, pasta, and this was the six to 11 serving per day, uh, and this is in 1992. And it changed uh, to all these different uh, areas here. Fruit, of course, was already known as being very healthy and vegetable, and then uh, dairy product, meat, not so much, but, and then on the top of that, fats and oil and sweet. This was what we lived with uh, until 2011. Then came my plate, and my plate, you can see here, uh, you have really, uh, since 2011, uh, th this is a little bit changed. This is fruit, this is vegetable, this is grain, this is protein, this is not meat anymore. This is plant protein as well as meat protein, and uh, you can see that there is still dairy uh, on the side here. And this is really the dietary guideline for Americans uh, generated by the USDA. Now, what is your diet here? <laughs> And I, I couldn't resist when I, uh, one of our speakers at Pennington came and showed us our diet. And I'm going to go through, I had a po' boy upstairs on the terrace before with a IPA. And uh, this is part of the Cajun food diet. Jambalaya, gumbo, red beans and rice, French bread, etouffee, etc., etc. And I think this is the diet that we have here. We know that it's not so good for the state because we are one of the worst state in the nation when it comes to obesity, diabetes, and some of these chronic disease associated with diet. But I have also a Cajun ex accent, and that's why I kind of like this diet. And is the beer somewhere here? No, it should be on the side. Oh, yeah, drink. The drink's here. Yeah, sorry. I missed that. Cheers to all of you. Now, uh, the uh, dietary guideline uh, for Americans uh, was renewed two years ago, and now we have these dietary guidelines, and this is here. We have one professor at Pennington who was part of establishing these guidelines, and now you can have guidelines every five years, and they change. The question is, what do we do with the guidelines? What do you do with the label on the food? First of all, I need my glasses and I cannot read them most of the time. <laughs> That's the first thing. But after they have done uh, studies of, you know, how people are good at uh, following the guidelines, and you can see that the score is pretty bad. A perfect score would be 100. And here, over the years, it's been oscillating between 56% and 60%. And this is independent, basically, of, uh, you know, the age or the race or all these kind of conditions here, uh, we are all as bad as we can when it comes to the diet. That's why we have to learn more, and this is what this Nutrition for Precision Health study will help us with. Now, since I'm from Europe, I decided also to show you a slide. Uh, you know, it was presented at a meeting I was in Switzerland last week showing that you know, the issue is maybe not the food or the nutrient, but it is the processing. We know that it's very convenient to buy a frozen meal, to buy these delicious meals, and nutrition companies have been amazing at using, you know, cheap and palatable food. And we like it, and this is what the American diet is turning to. But you can see that Italy, for example, is resisting to the uh, ultra-processed food, Romania, et cetera, et cetera. You have good countries in Europe and some bad countries. And we know it's associated with the health of these populations. 
Now, what is the best diet? Every year at Christmas time or New Year's time, they publish the best diet. 2013 was the DASH diet, the best diet for heart, healthy diet, uh, you know, for heart, best diet for diabetes, best diet for bone and joint, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we are fortunate to be at Pennington because Pennington designed or was part of the design of the DASH diet. And this was in the early 90s or late 90s, sorry, that uh, these four uh, centers here designed this uh, diet called the DASH diet, which was really uh, dietary approaches to stop hypertension. There was too much hypertension. How do we deal with that? And uh, people like Kathy Champagne, who is here, that I saw, oh, maybe I should go there. Uh, they designed this diet. About 30% of calories, low in saturated fat, that's the, you know, meat, uh, fat, and so on. Slightly higher in protein, usually it's about 15%. Higher in dietary fiber, sugar sweetened beverage avoided, and sweet consumed only occasionally. Those were the prescription. Now, what does it mean when we eat this diet? And I'm not going to go very long through that. But you know, it's uh, seven to eight serving daily of grains and grain product, vegetable as much as you can, fruits, whole fruit, not fruit juice, uh, but whole fruit, uh, fruits, low fat, non fat dairy food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this diet showed to be beneficial for the population in general. There's no question, again, if you feed the DASH diet to all of us, it's going to be an improvement in our health uh, compared to the average. It lowers blood pressure. It was designed for that. It is uh, equal to basically drug therapy for blood pressure. It's effective in all subgroups studied, men, women, black, white, people, with high blood pressure, people with normal blood pressure, all improved on this diet. It lowered the cholesterol and the LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol here was lowered. And there was no increase in triglyceride. When you, you go on a higher carbohydrate diet, you seem, uh, you seem uh, to increase your tri triglyceride. Now it's gonna be my last slide and then I left Leon to talk about the science we're gonna do. But this is the precursor to nutrition for precision health. This is one diet. Let's take the DASH diet that we just talked about. A lot of people are going to benefit from this diet. And this is a health benefit here. Some people are not going to benefit so much. It's like, you know, uh, in physical activity, if you are an endurance, uh, you train in endurance physical activity versus resistance, some are, are going to gain a lot, some much less, and some are not going to gain anything. This is the same with the diet. What, is, what are the factors influencing that? Of course, your genetics, your hormones in the blood, your medication that you take, how you take care of your health, your environment, and all your behaviors here are very, very important, and this is going to be assessed in these studies that Leanne is going to present. And then, you know, you put all these factors into a gigantic artificial intelligence. You feed a lot, a lot of data. Dr. Beck told us a million people, uh, in, uh, a, a million people, it's going to be a subset of about 10,000 people across the country. And you start to derive algorithms, taking into account all these factors and prescribing to you or to myself what, be, what would be the best diet. Leanne, come for the science. <laughs> she, she is my favorite postdoc. She started uh, 18 years ago with me, and now she's running the show. I'm not a postdoc anymore. <laughs> so you can, pick, you can pick your favorite diet. So we, we gave the... We gave the nice segue into the DASH diet, but you can pick your favorite diet, whether it's an Atkin diet or the American Heart Association diet. Pick your favorite one. Think about whether you did it with your spouse and think who did better and think who did worse, but know that maybe it wasn't because they weren't following the diet, right? 
So in science, a lot of the times when we do our controlled feeding studies at Pennington, our fallback was always if someone didn't do well on the diet, it was because they weren't following the diet. But we, even when we do a controlled feeding study, and what that means is that someone comes and lives at the Pennington, we prepare all of the meals in our kitchen and we provide it to them, we watch them eat it. Even in that environment, we see people that do well on the diet and people that don't seem to do as well on the diet. So these are all the factors that we think we need to understand so much better to understand what diet is best for everyone. So why precision nutrition? So that's where this NPH, Nutrition for Precision Health, project of the NIH um, comes into play. So as you can see, we've just established, right, that a poor diet, poor nutrition is a leading cause or at the epicenter of not only health, but also at many chronic diseases that we face here in America. We know that we have the US dietary guidelines. Not everyone follows them, we establish that. And it, it makes sense because really we can't have one recommendation to fit all the people. So we need to understand more about the physiological, the metabolic, the behavioral, the environmental factors that contribute to the way we respond to foods and the way we respond to these diets. we go. So the Nutrition for Precision Health project is really an exciting project. It is the first project that will be conducted by the newly established Office for Nutrition Research at NIH. It's crazy to think that nutrition is at the epicenter of health and disease, but it hasn't yet had its own office of focus at the, at the NIH, but now they do. It's a $170 million initiative, which is really exciting. It's the largest project that we've been a part of um, at the Pennington. Um, the, what I'm showing you here is a map of the US, obviously, that, but it's also highlighting the locations around the country that will be part of this study. So we are one of six centers that were, will be able to enroll participants into the trial. The other eight centers, or nine now, uh, centers that we call data generating centers. These are centers where we send, say, the blood samples to. These are centers that will get the stool samples to measure the microbiome. These are centers at, at West Point Academy that get all the data that they can put into the supercomputer to do the machine learning and artificial intelligence. But we're one of six to be able to participate, so it's very exciting to be have this here in Louisiana. And where the other centers are for the clinical studies, in case you're wondering, we have um, several centers here in California, so the West Coast is being represented. We have um, Chicago as a clinical center enrolling participants. We have somebody else who can uh, do, pay tribute to the Southern Diet because we have UAB down here in Birmingham. Um, Pennington has partnered with LSU, so we are not only in Baton Rouge, we're also gonna be able to enroll participants in New Orleans. There's a center at, um, in North Carolina through UNC and also up in the Northeast at Boston. So as Eric um, mentioned right at the very start, as well as Dr. Beck, is that this study is being founded from another project that's called All of Us. And the All of Us study is underway right now. And as the name implies, it's a research program for everyone. Um, many times I hear when I talk to people about, oh, where do you work? I work at Pennington. Oh, I've tried to sign up for studies at Pennington, but I never qualify. I'm too old. I'm not this color. I'm not that color. I don't have high enough blood pressure, whatever the case may be. But this is a project that is designed for everyone. And the idea is that we get at least one million Americans to join the project. We collect their basic information, but it links to their electronic health record. And the other thing is that we collect a DNA sample and then as you go to your doctor throughout your life and then we have your DNA that we can start to uncover genetic basis of diseases. In addition to that, now we have a group of people that we can invite into exclusive opportunities like this one for the Nutrition for Precision Health Project. So the NPH project, it's really exciting. As I mentioned, it includes three parts. And it's open to 10,000 people across those six locations around America. So all 10,000 people are gonna be involved in the first part, and that's here. So um, in Louisiana, we will need a little over 1,000 people, and they will come to either Pennington or they'll visit um, LSU HSC in New Orleans. 
And we are going to be asking you to record the Cajun diet. So for a period of 10 days, it's a nutrition study, so you will be able to choose what type of method that you would like to use to record your diet. So some people might like to use an app on their phone, so there's an app on your phone that you can use to take pictures. Some people may prefer to like record things just by writing it down, so we'll have a way for you to just capture it in a survey. And some people might like not like to do either of those things, so they'll get to wear a little camera on their eyeglasses that takes photos for them of everything that they're doing over that 10-day period of time. Kind of scary, but also kind of cool, right? Yeah, you've got to turn off the camera sometimes, right? So, um, in addition to that, people will be having um, an, an, a device on their wrist called an accelerometer, which measures physical activity. It also measures sleep. They'll also wear a continuous glucose monitor, which is a little device that goes on your skin. I have one on because I'm a test participant at the moment. It's right here on my, on my stomach. And it measures the um, sugar or glucose that's in your body. So you'll do that as well for the 10-day period. At the end of the 10 days, you come to the center and we're going to make you drink a special shake that's got a lot of goodness. It's got sugar and it's got fat and it's got protein it's got blueberries it tastes really good and we're going to measure how you respond to this shake everyone's going to get the same shake so that's where we start seeing right how how does somebody's sugar increase how does it not increase so much why does somebody not increase their sugar at all what are all the factors that come into play so that's the first study that everybody will do once you get done with that for over 10 days then you can come and choose to do two other trials and those are here. So the second one is going to be for about 2,000 people, 160 or so here in Louisiana. And now we're going to be inviting you to eat three diets. And we've designed all those diets. Kathy Champagne is here. She's had a very heavy hand in designing these diets. And I'm not going to tell you the popular names of these diets because we don't want to bias you. But one diet, I'll show you in a minute. I'll show you what they look like in a moment. But there's three diets. You eat all three diets, two weeks each and you'll get a break in between each one, and at the end, we're gonna test how you respond to the breakfast. You'll get a breakfast at the center. Same thing, but there'll be different breakfasts, one that goes with each of the diets. And you'll do all the diet recording again, collect stool and urine and blood and hair and all kinds of fun things. Um, that's that study. The last one is the same three diets, but now we're asking people to live at Pennington. So for the two weeks that you eat the diet, you will stay in so that there's no cheating, Right? So you said before, well, maybe they're cheating. That's why they didn't do so well on the diet. But now we take that factor out of the equation. So we have the full 10,000 reporting on the Cajun diet here. We need to get the Cajun diet on the map. Then we have about 2,000 people or, you know, 160 in Louisiana doing the three diets in their own life. And then we have about 50 people doing the same three diets, but they're going to live in. So I already mentioned some of the information that we're collecting and the purpose for those that we put them into the supercomputer. We use complex machine learning algorithms. We don't know what those are going to be yet. And at the end of the day, we're going to be able to learn what is the best diet, say, for this person. I always make the joke, like, we're going to have the green-eyed diet. How many people have green eyes? One. It's the diet for you, Paige. The green-eyed diet. But I'm just, I'm just joking, like, you know, who likes tennis? Maybe we need the tennis playing diet. Again, I'm playing around here. But, you know, what are the key factors that we need to understand to prescribe a unique diet for somebody? That's the goal here for this entire project. So the three diets are shown here. And as they're described, diet A, B, and C are the ways in which that we will describe them in, to the participants. But they're also called the purple diet, the orange diet, and the blue diet. So one diet, um, the first diet has high amounts of fruits and vegetables. This is an example of one of the meals. It also includes whole grains and beans, moderate amounts of dairy, meat, protein, uh, poultry and eggs, fish and nuts, uh, and vegetable oils, and low amounts of sugar and sweetened drinks. The second diet has high amounts of refined grains and as well as meat and poultry and eggs. It also includes some sugar sweetened drinks some sweets and snacks and desserts, sounding a bit like the Cajun diet to me, a moderate amount of dairy um, and small amounts of um, uh, fruits and vegetables and grains. And the last diet has moderate amounts of vegetables as well as proteins and fish and nuts and oils and low amounts of grains and sugars. So you can see that they're all really different. 
And maybe you can think about what um, the popular name is that goes with each of these diets, but we didn't want to bias people. So there's really, the sky's the limit here. You know, this project is thought to be a discovery science project. And what I mean by that is that, you know, typically when we design a study, we have a very clear aim and a very clear hypothesis that we're trying to prove or disprove. This is a discovery science project. There's not one aim and there's not one hypothesis. We really want to use all of the information that we're collecting to be able to answer a number of different questions, not only in the immediate term now for MPH, but in, in the years to come. So we've got um, a little QR code here on the back of the table tent. Um, if anybody was interested in learning more, in order to in, be invited into the NPH program, you have to be part of all of us, like I mentioned first. I know there's some people in the room that are already part of all of us because they've shook our hands earlier. Um, so Eric and I uh, are here to answer questions about nutrition and diet and coming to the Pennington to do studies, of course, NPH and all of that. So thank you very much. Remember, we've got to restate the question. You will restate the question. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes. So the question was about the three different diets and whether we would be controlling the amount of calories in those. Yes, the answer is yes, meaning that the diets would be scaled to the individual person. So we can estimate how many calories you need to remain the same weight for the 14 days, and that is the diet that you would receive. And we can tweak that actually very precisely to the nearest 100 calories. And we will tweak it. If your weight changes, we'll make adjustments. Dr. Champagne's nodding her head at me, yes. Yes, thank you. The question was about plant-based diets. There, there was no plant-based diet. Now, when you apply for a grant at NIH, you give your best shot. And one of our diet was a plant-based. It was a flexitarian diet, which allows some, you know, excursion into meat, but very rarely. Uh, it didn't go through when we have the consortium, when we have to talk all together and make decision. It means, no, we don't have a plant-based diet. I don't think we have a sustainable diet, mm -hmm. and I wish we had something like that. But who did recognize the diet there? Because I, I cannot resist, because uh, what, what is the first diet up there? Oh. Hang on, oh. you, Eric's going to blow the cover of the study right now. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone at home. I'm sorry, but you know, if you, if you go on a bike, you know that you're on a bike. <laughs> if you eat fish, you know that you are eating more of either the DASH diet or the Mediterranean diet. Uh, yes, it sounds like a healthy diet on the top. How about the middle? You, you, you kind of blew it because you said, sounds like the Cajun diet. <laughs> I didn't say the Cajun diet wasn't healthy. <laughs> and the lowest one? It, it's not Atkins, but it's low carbohydrate diet. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, did, I disclaimed everything. Oh, good. Yes, hi. Sorry, there's, I can't, can you? The question was whether the, this is a program for youth. The answer is TBD. We need an MPH for youth, yes. This particular one is for 18 and over. Good question. Yes? Oh, we've taken the meal planning out of that. So, you know, the great question. So the, the question was about meal planning. 
you basically just have to eat the food that we give you. So every three days, you'll come to the center, you'll get a cooler with all of the food for the next three days, right, Kathy? Breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. You could eat it all at breakfast if you would, if you would like to uh, every day. But every few days, you come back, uh, and you don't need to plan anything out, except you just need to eat the food. You have to talk loud. Did you hear it? Did you hear it? Can you stand up? Sorry. Please come. Sorry. Thank you. Come on stage. about the healthy eating index. Yeah, first, oh yeah, the, the, the question is, is when I showed the healthy eating index, there was a, a what is that? Oh, you're, ah, okay. Uh, there were differences in between uh, different people and the six to 11 years of age was kind of low. Uh, I, I think, you know, parents who have kids, they know that at this age, they go after all these processed food, candies and things like that, and they are not the best age to follow healthy guidelines. And I, I think it's maybe the reason. But, uh, you know, in babies, 61, it's better because, you know, either you breastfeed or you have formulas which have been formulated to be as healthy as possible, even if, if they are not ideal. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. I, like, like Leon said, this is a discovery study. It means, first of all, we, we don't, I, I, I cannot tell you, but it all depends of what markers you're going to look. This liquid uh, mixed meal tolerance test is going to be stimulating, uh, you know, pathways like carbohydrate metabolism, glucose and insulin. It is also high in saturated fat, and it will trigger some inflammation. And it all depends what you look at. And of course, you know, this measure of 10 days of continuous glucose monitoring will tell us about your carbohydrate metabolism. You'll have measurements of blood pressure, cardiovascular risk, and all that. But I cannot tell you which one is going to be better for you versus me versus you. And I think this is what it's called discovery at this point. And that's why you have to feed a lot of data in this data set for machine learning and then derive algorithm which could predict, you know, if I give you this diet, what are you, how is it going to be your response? Yes, yeah. it's going to group people together, yeah. responders and non-responders. And to follow up on this question, you know, I mentioned this is a $70, $170 million, it's five years. NIH have already said we're going to fund you for another five years, which means after we develop the algorithm and we can predict the diet for you, they then want us to test whether our prediction of this diet for you actually triggers the response that we expect. So that will be phase two. So we'll be back in a few years to, to test it. Yes. Yes, uh, this is an important question. Uh, the, the question is, if you have a food allergy, will you be disqualified for the study? First of all, not in this module one with 10,000 people, because they are not going to eat what they know that they have an allergy to. 
Now for the second module and the third module, yes, it's gonna be important to probe the people and know if they have food allergies. You know, if there was peanuts and you know, you're know allergic to peanuts, we're not gonna, you're not gonna qualify, but I'm sure there's no peanuts in the diet, Kathy. There, there is, oh, okay. Yeah, King Kate. King Kate. No, but we've tried to minimize foods that we know are common with allergies because we don't want to be able to eliminate a lot of people. But there's, for example, there's dairy. So if somebody has an issue with lactose, then it's not going to be a good fit for them. Or if a vegetarian, for instance, we don't have a plant-based diet. So that would be problematic for a vegetarian. That's, yes? Okay, so the question was asking, when you strap a camera on somebody's glasses, do you think that they're going to change what they eat because they know you're watching? That happens all the time in studies. People change their behavior because now you're watching, right? But the idea is that we've designed this to be 10 days long in order to capture what we're calling the usual diet. So it's unlikely that somebody can outlast a change for a 10-day period of time. So we will get snippets of the real diet at some point in there, but maybe so. And to your point that, yes, maybe with 10,000 people, we will, you know, be able to weed out some of that. The other thing is that we've got really well-trained uh, study staff, and we are going to be telling people, this is just to see what you do. Like, you don't have to change anything. This is to learn what is the diet in America, not what the dietary guidelines say the diet in America should be or is. What is the diet in America? And I think that's good motivation for people to tell the truth. We have a young man who has been very patient yeah. here. So the question was, with all the food that you're providing in the three diets, is that all paid by the NIH? Uh, yes, we are, we're not going to bill you for the food that we give you. <laughs> That's the first thing, because we wouldn't find too many people. I'll give you the recipes. But the, yeah. the second thing, yes, we, you know, our grant here in Louisiana is $8.6 million. It includes all the personnel which has been working to develop the study. It includes the personnel who are going to conduct the study. It includes a compensation for time and burden on people to come to the lab, have an IV line, drink a mixed meal tolerance test, and yes, your food is going to be free. <laughs> but you may be too young to qualify for the study. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the question is, it's for the future, but today, what is the best diet? It comes every year, you have this ranking of the diets. This year was the DASH diet. Last year was also the DASH diet. Two years ago was the Mediterranean diet. Now, for diabetes, for example, the American Diabetes Association has been working for a long time on the best diet. You know, uh, basically, uh, carbohydrate with low glycemic index. It means it doesn't shoot your blood sugar high very quickly. Uh, for uh, the American Heart Association, the low-fat diet has been promoted. Then came this ketogenic diet or Atkins diet or whatever you want to call it, which is a little bit an aberration for me as a scientist uh, because it's maybe a little bit better to lose weight, but in the long run, to have a high intake of fat is not going to be a good thing. Anyway, yes, there are diets, and each of these associations can tell you what is the best diet. And, you know, there's the MIND diet, which is in combination between the DASH diet and the Mediterranean diet, which has been developed. And it all depends if it's for cognition, for diabetes, for heart disease. 
Did you have a question? Yeah, the, the, it was a comment um, that as far as it was understood that we're focused on understanding health outcomes in relation to diet as opposed to diets needing to lead to some weight, weight as an outcome. It's a very good comment and I appreciate the comment a lot because, you know, a lot of what we talk about now is achieving health at every size. You know, but one thing that can't be argued from the science is that when we do improve the weight of somebody who's heavy, that many health benefits then follow. Improvements to their blood sugar, and maybe it's then insulin resistance or diabetes, improvements to their high blood pressure, their cholesterol, and all these things. But weight doesn't necessarily have to be the leading conversation, especially here when we're talking about improvements to diet. So I appreciate the comment. Do you want to add something? I think, I think you have a point. I think every time, you know, we ask, what is the best way to tackle fatty liver? It's to lose weight. That's the first thing. And the physician is going to prescribe some exercise and eat a little bit less, less fat and these kind of things. I think weight has been a major trigger of all these catastrophic number when it comes to the health of the nation. Uh, so the comment was about vegetarian, vegetarian or vegan options and why it's not part of the study. So, you know, the first thing is, you know, Eric and I, we had to write this grant to compete for this project. Then we get picked and now we come into a room with these 15 other centres, which is about 150 scientists. And we argued for the three diets that we proposed, which were the standard American diet, the Mediterranean slash DASH diet, which is the MIND diet, and a sustainable diet, the flexitarian diet, majority plant. We didn't win. We didn't win. And so there's a lot of complexities around providing one of the diets to be food for production. So Dr. Champagne could talk about that, like being able to produce everything in a way that can be done at all of these six locations around America, many of the things that we make will be made in the kitchen, but they have to be frozen ahead of time. You can't often do that with fruits and vegetables and having them be as palatable and taste well when they're then going to be served to, to people. So there was a lot of negotiating. It's like, I tell people, it's like Survivor and Big Brother, like all rolled into one when you get all these scientists together because we have these meetings and we have to vote for things. And before the meeting, there's like all these sidebar like alliances and phone calls, like who's gonna vote for what? And like, I tell Eric, you need to call so-and-so because we need this to pass at vote tomorrow. Like, it's like tribal council. Don't, don't, so give, don't give all the secrets. We won, we, won, we won some things, but we didn't win that one. Yeah, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so the question was, how's all this going to work down the road? Do you think that a primary care physician is going to have all the tools in their toolkit to be able to assess someone's diet and then make them a prescription. Yes, that is the hope. So I made mention that, you know, there's this is a nutrition study and we're going to collect a lot of nutrition information. Everyone will do pen and paper. People will have the eyeglasses. People will do the app. Some people will do all three of those things. And another major focus of the project is to understand how do you do dietary assessments in people? Because usually when you ask somebody what they eat, they lie right, to the question earlier about even when you put the eyeglasses, they're going to change. So we've still got a lot to learn about how a physician can accurately measure somebody's diet, and that's also built into this project. 
So that's one thing. The physician needs to have an accurate assessment of what you're eating. Then the second thing, he needs to be able to go into his electronic health record, right? Punch in a few things and then it needs to spit out because that's what happens now when you go to the doctor, right? It needs to spit out the diagnosis and then the diet that would be recommended. And that is what we hope will come from this project. I think you said it all, but I, there's the hope of technology also, which has been amazing to me. I mean, the fact that you can put contact lenses measuring your blood sugar or this patch that she, is, she has, and all this is going to be part of the assessment for the best diet. Now, once again, it's going to be the freedom of the people if they want to follow it or not. And, you know, a lot of people are not going to play the game because they like too much chocolate. Right. The first question was about whether or not we assess people's health conditions and whether we need to take those into account for whether they can join the study. In the 10,000 people, everyone can join unless you're like in hospice or some terminal, you know, condition that you're on a lot of medications and you couldn't come. That's the only thing. So it's for everyone, really. Then as we get into the three diets and then living in, of course, we need to evaluate things like alcohol dependency, for instance. If somebody has, needs dialysis and they have to go to a clinic a few days a week, like that's not going to work for those people. So our criteria for enrolling people have been really sensibly developed. It's to keep as many people in as possible and only to say no to the ones that it's just not a good fit for. And then your second question about physical activity or? Yeah, I, I want just to add also, for example, we had a lot of discussion on diabetes. Because when you give a diet, you're going to throw away the you know, way that they deal with their diet. And we excluded, first of all, type 1 diabetes, and second, type 2 diabetes who are requiring insulin. Now, the physical activity is an important factor in all this interaction between diet, physical activity, and health. And uh, at Pennington, we have another study which is called MotorPAC, which is molecular transducers of physical activity. And it's exactly the same concept of precision medicine. In other words, what is the kind of exercise which would benefit best this person versus this person? Now, if you look in the book, you know, I've been a runner all my life. Now I have a back which is killing me. I don't, I don't run anymore. But I never did lifting. And I regret that. I saw John Glenn at the uh, Congress saying, I have only one regret after all my training as an astronaut. I never did enough flexibility. And I have trouble to tie my shoes. And, you know, there are all these, these things. But the physical activity is an important factor into all that. Oh, yep. Yes. Uh, how do you all factor in uh, caffeine and alcohol consumption? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the question was caffeine and alcohol consumption. Back to the Cajun diet. How do we factor this in? So if you're a caffeine drinker, we're going to provide caffeine. Two cups of instant coffee. It's not the same, I get it, but two cups of instant coffee a day is pretty good. Now, when you're eating the three diets and you're at home, we know alcohol is going to be consumed and we're going to ask that you record it. Now, when you're living in, some of the centres around the country can't provide alcohol, so we're not providing it. We actually could, but it was ruled out. It's the big brother thing again. <laughs> The question is about vegetarian diets and not relying on meat. 
And I think Pennington has been very interested in that. Uh, I have been part of some papers uh, talking about sustainability of food, and especially with the climate change, like you mentioned. And I think that the efficiency of producing a calorie from meat versus eating the plant is enormous, and we're not going to be able to continue. It's like Bush was, de was saying we are ga gas guzzlers, and uh, now we know that it's, it's becoming a problem. It's going to be the same thing for food, and I think we have to be interested, and now with a uh, office at NIH on nutrition, this is something which is going to happen. Yes, so once, once these big projects are funded, then what happens is other scientists write projects to tack onto it. And so there are other scientists at Pennington that are interested now that we have this big project for their pet things to be studied, and that's something that we could do. And you may, you may know we have these metabolic chambers at Pennington. They're these, like, hotel rooms. They're small, and you go in, and you can measure your metabolism in there over 24 hours. And Eric and I will write a grant to put people when they come to spend the two weeks for a few days in these metabolic chambers so we can understand more how people's metabolism responds to these different diets, so how you're burning the calories depending on where they're coming from. All right, the MC is telling us we have one more minute. Well, one more question? What? Oh, Lucky luck. Oh, I ruined it. <laughs> it's all yours now. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Let's give a big round of applause for Dr. Redmond and Dr. Ravison. Thank you. This was a, what a great, great presentation. Um, so uh, as I said before, we have three lucky winners uh, tonight. Um, the winner of a WRKF beer stein, Lauren Lay. Lauren, right over there. And a uh, Campus Federal Travel Mug, uh, Brondon Krebs, up there. And a Campus Federal Umbrella, Kamaya Brown. Where's Kamaya? Up there. OK, she's up there. Congratulations. Thank you all for coming. Um, I want to let you know, next month, our, um, our Science Cafe will be on the last Wednesday of the month. Um, it will be on uh, March 29th when we'll have LSU cybersecurity expert Dr. Abe Begali talk about security and privacy in virtual reality and in the metaverse. I've seen his talk. You do not want to miss this. It is going to be absolutely great. Thank you all for, wait. Oh, and you can sign up for the, for, uh, you can sign up for the study on a paper right over here. Oh, up at the table um, with Ernie and sign up, participate, be part of science. Thank you all for coming and we'll see you next month.